Hi, this is Dr. Bueller, and I'm going to be giving you a very brief uh, overview of male and sexual anatomy review. I know you guys have had this multiple times, and um, I just want to make sure that you're ready for the pharmacology. So we're going to talk about a few drug targets. We're going to start with male sexual and urinary anatomy. And the reason I'm going to talk about urinary anatomy is I want to make sure that you guys understand the role of the prostate in terms of urinary versus ejaculatory anatomy. So we're talking about the path of urine from the kidney to outside of the body. The urine is made within the kidney. It is transferred through the ureter, which is not the same as the urethra. The ureter is a tube that's going to transfer the urine into the bladder itself, where it's stored. There's a bladder sphincter that's going to keep urine from leaking out into the urethra. And when that bladder sphincter opens and the bladder muscle walls contract, then urine is released into the proximal urethra, which is the tube that is right here at the very beginning of the urethra, proximal to the bladder. That proximal urethra actually travels inside the tissue of the prostate. The prostate is wrapped around it. So if you think of this as a donut, the prostate is wrapped around it and the tube of the proximal urethra is going to then travel through it. In normal urinary anatomy, the prostate should not be swollen and the area should be relaxed enough and open enough that the urethra is able to unimpededly carry urine through the urethra. If the prostate itself is swollen and it starts to impede and pinch into the urethra, then it's going to be difficult for urine to flow. The prostate then um, can compress the urethra and interfere with flow if it's swollen. Urine, after it goes through the prostate, is going to go into the distal part of the urethra and then it's going to exit the body at the head of the penis or at the glands. I'm going to have some self-quiz questions. I'm not going to go over them in the actual lecture here, but I am going to provide you slides and you can, the slides will, go, will have the answers to these questions in the notes sections. If you're not in one of my classes, don't worry about it. The answers are within the presentation itself. So when we talk about spermatogenesis and ejaculatory anatomy, we're going to share some of the pathway, the distal urethra, with urinary anatomy, but everything before the prostate and distal urethra is going to be separate. So here we have a picture of the testes, and the testes are where sperm are going to be produced and stored. So sperm, properly known as spermatozoa, are going to be produced by Sertoli cells within the testis itself and then they're going to be stored within the epididymis. You don't need to memorize that they're stored within the epididymis, but we know that they're in there and they're just waiting for ejaculation to occur. If ejaculation occurs, they're then expelled through a tube called the vas deferens and then out, and we're going to see as the vas deferens then starts to hook up with the rest of the anatomy. So here we had the testis that we talked about before, the epididymis, and going through the vas deferens. And the vas deferens was actually quite long. It's going up around the bladder, sorry, and down to where it's going to then hook up within the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle is going to have excretions in it or fluids that are going to be able to mix with the sperm that were coming up through the vas deferens. So they're going up here and they're passing through that seminal vesicle and then they're passing through the ejaculatory ducts. So the ejaculatory ducts open up and the semen is going to be able to come into that 
proximal urethra, which is very, very close to where the proximal, where the urine starts to come in out from the kidney. I'm sorry, <laughs> from the bladder. So this is where the pathways for sperm and for um, urine are going to now come together. The ejaculatory duct is going to be within that prostate and from those ejaculatory ducts now sperm are going to enter that proximal urethra and as the, the semen starts to come out we're going to add fluids and secretions also from the bulbal urethral gland. So we're going to have sperm coming up through the vas deferens. We're going to add fluids from the prostate, from the ejaculatory duct, and from the bulbal urethral gland. And all of those secretions plus the sperm are going to form semen. So all of these together are what we term semen. The semen is then going to be able to exit the body through the urethral pathway, which is shared with the urinary, urinary pathway. And it exits the body upon orgasm by the contraction of various muscles, including the prostate gland muscles. So that's going to be pushing semen out through the distal urethra. If the prostate is not able to contract rhythmically properly in order to push out the semen, then you will not have the ability to have proper ejaculation. So that was the bigger part of the anatomy. Now we're going to talk about the anatomy and uh, cellular anatomy of erection itself. And this is important because this is where we're going to have our drug targets. So we're going to have the, um, when you look at a cross section of the penis, here on the bottom on the left, we're going to see the cross section of a non erect or a flaccid penis, and we're going to see a cross section of an erect penis. Now, in the middle of the penis here, we have these areas called the corpus cavernosa. And these are areas that can be filled with fluid, uh, the fluid being blood vessels coming into there. And normally, these areas in the corpus cavernosa the, are very small. They're held small because of muscle cells that are actually lining these regions. So I'm going to take blue here, and I'm going to draw muscle cells around each of these. And as long as those muscle cells are contracted, then those corpus cavernosa cannot open up and blood can't flow into them to a great volume. So in order to get blood to flow in, in order to cause volume increase and cause rigidity, we're going to need to open up and relax those smooth muscles around the corpus cavernosa. So here, what we need to do is we need to relax those muscle cells. So how do we do that? Muscle cells, smooth muscle cells, can be relaxed by nitric oxide. And so we see up here at the top that nitric oxide release, which is released from nerves, not from the smooth muscle itself, but from nerves, is going to be released onto the smooth muscle cells. And that's going to cause production of cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP is the the molecule that's going to cause the muscles to relax. So it's being released within the muscle cell itself. It's going to cause relaxation. Cyclic the GMP also has to be broken down, like everything else, and it's going to be broken down by an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. There are several subtypes of phosphodiesterase. In this case, the one in the corpus cavernosa cells is phosphodiesterase 5. That's important because there are phosphodiesterases in all sorts of parts of your body. And if you're going to utilize a drug to try to manipulate phosphodiesterase, you don't want to affect every part of your body. So using something fairly specific for PDE5 is going to give you effects that are fairly specific for erection. 
So to have erection, you're gonna to want to have a good balance between nitric oxide and PDE5. So as long as you have nerve stimulation releasing nitric oxide, you're gonna keep your CGMP levels up, you're gonna keep muscle relaxation occurring, and you're gonna allow blood flow in and erection to continue. So what causes nitric oxide to be released? Well, the mechanisms that cause or the inputs that cause nitric oxide to be released from the nerves are gonna be physical stimulation, so stimulation of the genitals or any tissue that's going to cause physical sexual stimulation and psychological stimulation. That's not how you spell psychological. So physical and psychological stimulation and usually a combination of those will cause those nerves to release nitric oxide onto the smooth muscle cells. That's causing your cyclic GMP. And as long as you have a lot of nitric oxide being released, then your nitric oxide release is greater than your PDE5 breakdown. You're keeping good levels of cyclic GMP and erection is going to continue. Once nitric oxide stimulation decreases, PDE5 is gonna break down your cyclic GMP and those, cells are, those muscle cells are going to contract again, and now you're going to block erection and have a loss of erection. So it's this balance between nitric oxide and PDE5 that's going to manipulate whether or not you're going to have erection or not. So let me go ahead and erase what's in here so I can show you those places where we can do pharmacological if we come in and we increase nitric oxide release or we give nitric oxide into the local tissue of the penis, then that's going to increase cyclic GMP and it'll produce erection. Decreasing activity of PDE5 will also increase cyclic GMP and increase erection. So we have one that we can increase nitric oxide, one drug target that we can decrease PDE5. When we first started doing erectile dysfunction therapies, nitric oxide could be injected into the penis tissue for kind of obvious reasons. That was not uh, an optimal uh, route of administration and nitric oxide is very, very short lived. Now we have drugs that are going to be orally available that block PDE5 and that's gonna keep our cyclic GMP up and that's going to keep erection longer. And that's what we use for treating erectile dysfunction. PDE5 inhibitors we use for erectile dysfunction. Many people have um, an incorrect belief that those will actually cause erection in and of themselves. But they're not gonna cause erection unless nitric oxide is being released in the first place. So stimulation has to be occurring and PDE5 inhibitors are then going to just allow cyclic GMP to be around, to stick around, to allow erection to occur. But they won't cause it. So that's the end of the uh, male sexual anatomy. And then we're going to go ahead and I'm going to stop this and start a new video for female sexual anatomy.